also, I'd, I'd like to present to Curtis on behalf of the Park Service, we cannot offer much to our living history groups. Uh, they give so much of their time and they donate so much. Uh, for the demonstration and myself and Acting Sergeant Major Miller, we're all volunteers. Uh, in addition to the uh, three Tennessee units, the 1st, the 7th, and the 14th, which were actually the three Tennessee regiments that fought here at Gettysburg, also in our battalion, we have a company from the 13th Virginia. And um, basically, as Tom said, my job is to sort of explain to you what's going on with linear tactics because basically most people look at this and they say, why in God's name are people fighting shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, going across open fields in the face of the firepower they had to face? Well, one of the things that's important to understand is the Civil War is a period of great transition in military technology. In fact, in the, about the, the 25, 30 years prior to the war, there had been some significant changes in how and why certain types of tactics were used. Now, prior to the Civil War, what's the major war most of these people that fight in the Civil War served in? They fought in the Mexican War. Virtually every senior officer on this field had served in Mexico. A lot of the volunteer officers, in fact, had served as enlisted men in the Mexican War, at least among the senior leadership. And the reason I bring that up is they are fighting, even in, this is 1846, 1847, they are fighting with a smooth bore musket. You can hold your weapon up. This is an example of it. This is a model 1842. 69 caliber smooth bore musket. It's basically kind of like a long barreled shotgun. Its controllable range of accurate fire is only about 100 to 150 yards, even in mass volley fire. So, what you are trying to do is you have a very short killing range before you get rifles. Now, another change that this weapon made is if you will note, again, hold up so they can see the lock. That's the firing mechanism. And the firing mechanism on this weapon is a percussion cap. Now, a percussion cap is a great innovation. Most people don't realize this. Very many people are very acquainted with rifle technology changing, but the percussion cap is a small brass or copper cap that is filled with fulminate of mercury. What's your primary form of ignition prior to the invention of percussion caps? Flintlock ignition. Flintlock ignition, while an improvement on its predecessors, is still a notoriously unreliable system, particularly for military type activities. Now, one of the great military institutions of the 19th century, the British Army, which never did anything in a hurry, studied flint ignition versus percussion ignition over a period of 12 years, both in Britain and in India, and after test firing literally hundreds of thousands of rounds, came to the conclusion that in the average weather conditions, whether you're in India, or you're in Britain, of a thousand fires with a flintlock musket, you're going to have just over 400 misfires. With percussion ignition, you're going to have slightly less than four misfires per thousand. So during the Civil War, you know, in addition to the fact that you've gone from the smoothbore musket to a rifled musket, where your range has gone from about 100 to 150 yards to three to 400 yards of killing range, you also have about 40% more lead flying down range. The problem is, all of these things are relatively new developments. This was the first U.S. military long arm, well, actually this in the 1841 rifle that had percussion ignition. Now, one of the things about the changeover on rifles, and unfortunately I forgot to bring a mini ball out with me, mini ball is a great invention too. Because, you know, you say, well, we fought the American Revolution with rifles and all these other things. No, by and large, we fought with muskets. 
because old style rifling, the rifles, to get it to work, to get the ball to actually engage with the lands and the grooves in a rifle, you either wrapped it with an oiled patch or an oiled cloth and forced it down into the grooves. The mini ball, which is a French invention from the 1840s, is a, most of you have probably seen it, it's a cylindro conical shaped bullet that's cupped out in the back. That means it's slightly smaller, it's made slightly smaller in the bore of the weapon, and when that lead ball is forced down on top of the powder, the explosion goes into that hollow base and blows the walls out of that lead round into the rifling so it engages. So now you've got twist. So basically, the big change here is you have rifled musket fire, which gives you controlled fire out to about 300 to 400 yards range. You also have 40% more lead going down range because of percussion ignition. The problem is they hadn't had time to really start alternating and changing the tactics. Rifles do not become standard issue in the United States Army until 1855, just six years before the war starts. And these are both rifles and rifle muskets, a rifle musket being a somewhat longer version. The regular army at the outbreak of the Civil War is about 14,000 men and officers all, all told. By the time you get to Gettysburg, between both the Confederacy and the Union, you have over one and a half million men under arms. We don't have time to rewrite the playbook. Basically, the only major change that had been made in the last major change, what was known as Hardee's Light Infantry and Rifle Tactics, was the speed that you marched in doing your various maneuvers changed. That was all they did. They were still using linear tactics because the objective is to throw a wall of lead under control at a specified range and target. Now, a lot of you think, well, why didn't they fight more dispersed? Well, one is they were afraid they couldn't keep the men under control. You have to understand, you know, in addition to the technological difficulties, you've got some social type difficulties, which is, well, okay, officers are basically middle class or upper class individuals, and they can be relied upon. The enlisted force may not be, this is not so true. And this was particularly a mentality in the regular army. Now, this isn't necessarily so true in the volunteer army, where, you know, you have all kinds of people coming into the volunteer ranks from a variety of stations. But the thing is, it was felt you had to keep the men under control, and therefore you usually kept them pretty tightly controlled. Sometimes you did have skirmish order where the men would be spread out. And that would be used basically to feel the enemy. But, you know, you usually had to be very, very well drilled to execute that type of maneuver and keep the men under control. Now, another intricacy that comes from doing this loading and firing, again, when you're packed in tight, is the fact that this is a muzzle-loading weapon. It loads from the top. And... The men were trained to do this in very close ranks, which meant everybody basically had to be doing the same move the same way. <coughs> Pardon me, maybe not necessarily at the same time, but what they did was they taught the men to load and fire in nine times. There's nine separate procedures for loading a musket. And Sergeant Major Meller here is going to demonstrate as I give the command so you can see. Imagine if he's got people all around him. Loading fire in nine times. Load. The weapon is brought down diagonally in front of the body. Muzzle pointed away from your face and also the muzzle pointed away if there was a man, if there's somebody here in the front rank, away from the back of his head. Handle cartridge. You'd reach back, unsnap your cartridge box, which is a leather box. You pull out a cartridge, which is a paper tube that has a lead ball in the base. 
and approximately 65 grains of powder on top of that to push it. The lead ball itself is almost an ounce of pure lead. So it's a fairly heavy slug. Tear cartridge. You would tear the top of the cartridge open with your teeth. One of the primary requirements to get into the infantry was you had to have two opposing front teeth among the eight front teeth in your mouth. Otherwise, you couldn't go in the infantry. Now, you, you know, you laugh about this, and we think this is amusing. In countries in Europe, such as Russia, where there was conscription, and when you got conscripted in Russia in the mid-19th century, it was for 25 years. It was essentially a life sentence. Some of the peasants used to take, particularly if they were good, healthy males, and break the eight teeth out of the front of their children's mouths so that they wouldn't get conscripted. It's universal. This is how everybody loads their musket. So you've got this musket cartridge torn open. You now have it at the muzzle of the weapon. Charge cartridge. You would pour the powder down into the barrel, force out the ball, and you would loosen the ramrod in its pipes. Draw rammer. It's done in two motions. Everybody going the same way. Otherwise, you've got people spinning things in different directions, clanging, battering, losing all sorts of cohesion. Ram cartridge. Cartridge will be rammed in, forced the ball down onto the powder in the breech of the weapon. Return rammer. The rammer is brought back up again in two motions and put into the pipes. Prime. At this maneuver, you take a half step. You narrow yourself as a target toward the enemy. You bring the weapon up above your cat box. You take out a percussion cat and place it onto the vent. Now, when you get to this point, if you're obviously ready to engage the enemy, you would be directed to fire. But the normal procedure at this point would be shoulder, arm. And everybody gets back to this position. You know they're all loaded because although you're trained to do it in nine separate steps, the command you would get in the field would simply be load. And you would do, you would know to do all nine steps. Now what we have out here today, we have two small companies. We'll work kind of as a small battalion. Now, here at Gettysburg, very many rifle companies in both armies only numbered about 28, 29 to 30 or 35 men. They're fairly small organizations. Their book strength is actually 100 officers and men. But because during the Civil War you don't have replacement like you do in the modern army, as you suffered casualties and losses, very rarely would these be replaced. So you'd have companies that are basically fighting with about 30% strength at this battle. Now the colonel is working the men through some of the basic maneuvers you would use to, con again, you don't want to make yourself a very obvious target to the enemy until you absolutely have to. And there were a variety of moves that could be made using columns of companies, marching in fours, which was your typical marching formation. And you could go from a column of companies as they are doing now into a line of battle. If you could imagine six or seven companies stacked one behind the other, this can be done very quickly and very easily. Now this is also one of the reasons why if you've ever read anything about the Civil War as far as letters or diaries, what's one thing the men are constantly complaining about? They drill all the time. I mean, constant, constant, constant amount of drill. Well, it's necessary to maintain the skill and ability to do these things instantaneously on word of command or on command of a musical instrument. That's another thing people don't understand about Civil War music. Most people think it's just there for marching. If you look in the back of a tactics book, there are 30-odd pages of musical instructions for giving command including firing, cease firing, moving by the right flank, moving by the left flank, double clicking, regular time, because what's one of the things that's uh, 
as, as you're going to find out, what's wrong with the Civil War battlefield regarding communication? It's very loud. And if you're a human being, what's the only tool you have? Well, you got your ears for hearing. You got your voice for giving orders. All orders have to be given in voice or in writing. Not very easy. So that's why if you've got musical instruments which can be masked to give orders, that works a lot better. Now what they're doing here is wheeling around, you know, both companies to reach for a common front. Now among the various types of fire that you could use, fire, as again I said, you did this shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow stuff to keep your fire under control. Under the direction of your officers, your battalion commander. And they had several different methods that were available to them depending on the type of target you're firing at, the range you're firing at, and your intended effect. Now the first type of firing that they will be doing is a battalion fire. One big volley, everybody fires. This is particularly useful at long range, say approximately 300, 400 yards. It's also very good against a massed large target if you are facing a cavalry charge. Terribly effective. But one of the things about a massed volley fire, because you can also do it at short range if you have the time, and this is when it works best, is the horrific psychological shock of a mass fire. Because instead of saying having one, two, three casualties occur within your sort of peripheral view over the course of, say, a minute or so of firing, you're hit by volley fire, you're going to see 9, 10, 11 within your field of view in one instant. And the colonel will now demonstrate to you the effect of a mass volley fire. can imagine the effect this would have if, say, you've got a 250, 300, 400 man battalion, particularly at close range. However, this has a great tactical disadvantage. Everybody's unloaded simultaneously. Now, that's why you do it at long range. It's not going to matter a whole lot. And this is why sometimes you do it at close range because you want to just cause a lot of casualties at once. But there were alternative methods available to battalion commanders and field grade officers to control the fire of the battalion so that they would have some men firing while some were loaded. And we'll now demonstrate several of those to you. <coughs> the first he's going to demonstrate is fire by company, where each company fires independently at the direction of its captain. Slow. 
with just two companies, but most battalions are going to have seven, eight, nine, or if you've got a full-size regiment, ten companies. Now, another method, if you wanted to have a wider field of fire, but still have some control, was a method called fire by rank. Now, in fire by rank, the commanding officer would allow one rank to fire, again, they would reload, and then the other rank would be available to meet whatever emergency was avail was there. allows you to keep at least some fire going down range almost continually. Now one weapon which I have not talked about yet, which is also in the infantryman's equipment, and which people seem to think they know a lot about, is the bayonet.
become apparent to you why we've done this in a moment. <laughs> now, as you can see here with the sergeant's weapon, a bayonet, walk along the line and let him see, is a pretty fearsome looking weapon. They spent a lot of time working out the design of this weapon. And you'll say, well, what's the big deal? It's just a knife blade. Well, you'll notice as he goes by, the blade is triangular. It is not a knife blade. It was done intentionally so that if a wound was made, it would create a jagged wound that does not close easily. That was done on purpose. You'll also notice there are little grooves on the side. That's basically an anti-vacuum lock because if you stab a man in the abdomen, it's going to try to close around it because there's no air in your abdomen. And you've got it that way to allow some air in so it's easier to get the weapon back out. However, a bayonet, in many ways, in fact, in virtually all ways, by the time of the Civil War, and in fact, even in the Napoleonic Wars, the Revolutionary Wars, whatever, it is essentially a weapon of psychological shock, not physical shock. Just in the same way that a mass volley fire often frightened you, if you were in a line somewhere and had to face a solid line of men with bayonets coming at you, and even when they were taking casualties, their ranks closed and kept coming at you, you start thinking about something else that you really don't want to stand there and have to deal with it. Because again, this is primarily psychological shock. And even though you hear a lot about bayonet fighting in the Civil War, if you look at federal casualty records, less than 1% of all wounds and fatalities were caused by edged weapons of any sort. Sword, bayonet, knife. So you get the idea that when these guys got into very close quarters, the people that were on the defensive had three options. Counterattack, stand and defend, and hopefully break the other side, or break themselves, because again, it's more of a psychological strain than anything else.